Good morning, and may it please the Court. My name is Ann Jocknick from Greater Boston Legal Services, and I represent the appellant Emmett Bridgewaters, and with me is James McCrae and Dick Bauer at the table. This case concerns the eviction of a mentally disabled tenant, Mr. Bridgewaters, after nearly 40 years of trouble-free tenancy. Four and a half years ago, at a time when Mr. Bridgewaters' physician had suspended his disability medications, Mr. Bridgewaters had a serious physical altercation with his twin brother. The fight arose during one of the worst possible discussions where Mr. Bridgewaters had revealed that he had been abused as a child by their parents. Mr. Bridgewaters has remained as a tenant since the fight under an order of the single justice of the appeals court conditioned on maintaining treatment and on good behavior. <coughs> under the Federal Fair Housing Act and Boston Housing Authority's own reasonable accommodation policy, Mr. Bridgewaters was entitled to be considered for reasonable accommodation of his disability to allow him to maintain his tenancy. And how, how at that, before we get to the post-trial motions, um, how was the issue preserved? The issue of the disability preserved at, at the underlying hearing? At the, at the, Mr. Bridgewaters raised his, uh, at the hearing, Mr. Bridge at the underlying hearing, uh, in the, in the Boston Housing Court, Mr. Bridgewaters raised his disability four different times. He uh, testified as to the um, lack of um, significant, uh, sufficient treatment at the time of the incident, and he also testified in detail to the, the new treatment that he had engaged Excuse in. Excuse me, didn't he, uh, it wasn't his position that he had not um, been involved and that it, his brother had actually inflicted the injuries, self-inflicted injuries? Mr. What, wasn't that his position? Mr. Bridgewaters never denied his involvement in the fight with his brother. His, he did have a different version of the fight um, from his brother's version, but he never denied his, his involvement. And to the extent that he raised a, a defense that he was fighting in self-defense, which he did, he also raised an alternative defense based on his disability, which was he, he was entitled to, and the lack of sufficient treatment at the time and the new treatment. Where, where in the record does he or, or anyone on his behalf ask for reasonable accommodation? At what page am I going to find that? Um, let's see. Um, in, in the record, um, Mr. Bridgewaters did not use, in, in the, at the trial, Mr. Bridgewaters did not use the words reasonable accommodation, but he was not required to. What he was required to do was make it clear that he, what he was seeking was a change to the rules or policies that a reasonable person would understand to be a change to the rules and policies based on his disability. So he did not use the words reasonable accommodation, but he did. What you mean is he, he said, I want to stay, he and said, that would be a change I want to rules. stay. Yeah, I want to change in the policy. I want to stay, even I want though to stay. I committed a very serious crime, exactly. violating my lease and law. Exactly. I want to stay. Exactly. So that's the reasonable accommodation he requested. That was the reasonable accommodation. What kind of reasonable accommodation are you suggesting here? <clears throat> the, 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 the accommodation would be, as in um, this court has recognized in Penfield, is an opportunity to maintain his treatment in light of, uh, in, maintain his tenancy in light of the intervening treatment that he received. So he had gotten back on medications. His doctor suspended the medication. Well, there wouldn't be any reasonable accommodation. It would just be let him stay. In other words, don't evict. It would be an exception to the rule that uh, ordinarily, the, if the tenant hadn't been disabled and had engaged in this behavior, that the housing authority would have evicted, as in, as in Penfield, where the tenant well, would have been okay, evicted. Well, what happened? Wasn't there an attempt by the um, BHA at reasonable accommodation, there was a conference, and the defendant, uh, the um, yeah, he's the defendant here, um, refused to discuss the case and, and ordered his social worker who was with him to remain silent. Am I reading? No, that wrong? well, there was a private conference. Yeah. Um, the tenant attended that private conference with two of his social workers, one from the <coughs> Department of Mental Health. He his his attorney at the time, which he was unrepresented in the eviction case. The record is silent as to who the attorney is, but we would have to presume that it was his criminal attorney had um, advised him not to speak there, not inappropriately. There's nothing in the record to reflect that he ever ordered his social workers not to speak there. Um, the testimony of the BHA manager was that the, the conference asked, lasted for 30 minutes. At the end of the conference, 
the um, Boston Housing Authority gave Mr. Bridgewater's the lease termination notice, which under its own reasonable accommodation plan was supposed to tell him about his right to request an accommodation, which the social workers would have been in the best position to help him to do. And that notice didn't contain that didn't contain that, um, that, that information, it didn't comply with the, the plan. And then weeks before trial, weeks before trial, um, the Tenancy Preservation Program, which is a, a court-related program at, at the Boston Housing Court designed to attempt to preserve the tenancies of disabled people, had contacted Boston Housing Authority. Um, on behalf of Mr. Bridges. And the Housing Authority didn't want to talk to them at that time. Refused I understand. To have any but discussion. what happened during that 30 minute conference way back? Um, the, the record doesn't reflect much more than that, other than um, the um, social worker, there were, you know, the two social, social workers were there, Mr. Bridgewaters was there. This, the, what the transcript says is that the social workers advised him not to speak because that had been the advice of his attorney. And again, he was unrepresented. Well, then, so then, Conceivably, that may well have been some attempt to discuss it, and, and he wouldn't participate. Well, that private conference was required under the rules. So, um, is that private conference an appropriate time to make a request for an accommodation? Um, certainly, it's an appropriate time, but a request Not for sure. an accommodation can be made any up any uh, time uh, up uh, until the did point. Did the social of workers at that at that thirty minute conference make any kind of a request that could be identified as an accommodation on behalf of, of Mr. Bridgewater? There's nothing in the record to reflect that. However, um, had BHA's notice notified of them, notified them, I don't know what their understanding of the law was, and um, had it notified them that he had a right to a reasonable accommodation if he was disabled, they may have been, they were obviously in a position to do that better than Mr. Bridgewater's himself. And certainly subsequent to that, when, um, when, when the Boston Housing Authority was contacted by the Tenancy Preservation Program, the, on behalf of Mr. Bridgewater's, it refused, it refused to, the Boston Housing Authority refused to have any sort of discussion about preserving the tenant. So it, it, right there, it impeded any effort to have any dialogue about what, what accommodation might be appropriate, what the nature of the risk was here, if anything, what, um, what the intervening treatment was, whether it was sufficient. Can, can, you, can you help me a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, refresh my memory. We, we grant, granted a limited further appellate review on this, did we not? Yes, you did, Your Honor. What is the limitation? What is the issue we're considering? It's limited to the issue of reasonable accommodation. Um, there was a, the second issue that had to do with notice, which is not before the court here, with a, with a, separate, with a, a separate notice issue. Well, all right, but uh, reasonable accommodation in what sense? Because the first part of the appeals court opinion says he did preserve no record on reasonable accommodation, and then they went on to for four, four or five pages discussing <coughs> in, in the abstract. So if the limited is in fact only that issue, you're out, you're out, aren't you? We didn't grant any review of the appeals court determination on the merits that the record wasn't preserved, did we? Um, the, the, um, what this court um, granted review on was the issue of reasonable accommodation generally without any limitation. And that was in contrast to there was a second independent claim that was based on. Well, then the limitation has no real meaning. We might, we've granted FAR on everything, if that's the case. Uh, th there was a second issue that had to do with the form of the notice, um, notice to quit in this case, that it was effective um, immediately. And that issue is not before the court. Um, and the, the, um, what, the, what the appeals court um, based its determination on was, was it didn't make that reference that it did not believe that there was enough in the record below, although we, we disagree with that because of the... Well, that's the holding in the appeals court. It's not a reference. It's the holding. It, that's one thing that the appeals court said, and in addition, the The appeals rest of the stuff is dicta. Well, well, uh, the appeals court does go on to say that even if it had been preserved, it wouldn't apply in this case because of the violent act, the nature of the act. Which is classic right. dicta. What, what the appeals court said is that um, what the appeals court said is that um, there was insufficient um, evidence in the record below, or this is not the kind of evidence that we normally make a decision. You know, it's not sufficient. We would agree. We, we disagree with the appeals court determination on that issue, um, both because of what Mr. Bridgewater has raised at trial, where he clearly, and even the appeals court recognized that he clearly um, made out a defense based on his disability. Even the appeals court recognized that. And the lower court, the trial court, 
never even addressed that defense in its decision, in its initial, in its initial decision. They didn't say there was insufficient evidence. They didn't say um, anything. They just didn't mention it, um, the, the lower court. And, um, and then subsequently in the, post, um, in the post-judgment motions, Mr. Bridgewaters did present um, additional evidence about from both his, his physician and his social worker, um, evidence as to the nature of his disabilities, um, specific symptoms, the new treatment that he was getting, the, the medications, the fact that the, the incident was unlikely to recur and that uh, he was not a risk to anyone um, with, the, with the new treatment in place. And we would submit that that's, that was sufficient, if, um, sufficient evidence in order to make a decision. But um, even if it were, uh, um, in addition to that, the um, post-judgment motion, this case is also on, a, we were also appealing the court's decision on the post-judgment motions, and those motions were just setting out the bare bones of the, of the claim to the extent that it, um, as required under the rules, to the extent that there, the court had, had decided the post-judgment motions under a correct legal standard and, and under a correct factual determination. Post-trial motions, and I don't know what exact rules you were invoking, but are usually highly discretionary with the judge. You recognize that? Yes, of course. We, we recognize that, that it's, there's broad discretion to, dis, to decide the post-trial motions. But in this case, Particularly the court, if the judge decides the claim wasn't raised. Right. The, the, the judge decided that, that, the, that the tenant had never, um, had made, had never raised the claim. But, the, but the, in, in when he ruled on um, the Rule 59 motion, he said, I haven't had a chance to listen to the tape either. And, and then when the transcript clearly demonstrates that the tenant raised his disability four different times, he, clear, he said twice, I'm raising it as a defense. The, the appeals court recognized that it was clearly a defense um, to his misconduct. Um, and, and he also, um, again, spoke about his subsequent treatment um, that, that he had received. Could I ask you, it's, it's a separate question. I, I don't mean to interrupt if you um, On the in terms of the merits of the claim that the, that the appeals court, in its view that this kind of act by itself makes it unnecessary to consider um, uh, a disability, or di if we, and, and I take it that part of your argument is um, there's a big distinction between the Fair Housing Act and how it deals with disability and employment law and how it does. And so my question is, if one were to agree with you, would one need to not change, I mean, to, to disagree with Skolnick, not, not in terms of was there accommodation there, but just in terms of its discussion of, the, of what the Fair Housing Act requires in terms of discrimination and disability? No, uh, we, we don't believe that you need to disagree with Skolnick. What, what the court said in Skolnick was that in the fair housing context, um, if you are going to evaluate, first of all, the word qualification never right. appears in the Fair Housing Act, but if you are going to evaluate it, the court recognized, this court recognized, as it, as it did in Penfield, that it's part and parcel of the reasonable accommodation um, evaluation so that if a tenant, uh, a tenant is qualified, if he, can, if he or she can meet his, their, his tenancy obligations with a reasonable accommodation, and the court in Skolnick went on to apply that standard and said um, these tenants, the tenants in Skolnick, are not qualified because even with the accommodation there, which was um, a, the similar to here, was a what, forbearing from eviction to allow them to access treatment, even with that accommodation, they were unlikely to meet their tenancy obligations because that had been tried repeatedly in the past and the tenants, and, and it hadn't been successful in addition to other, other state, accommodations. State of diff state of different, differently. When there's a claim of disability and the tenant makes a, a request for reasonable accommodation, as Justice Cordy said here, remain as a tenant, then the burden shifts to the landlord to say that the accommodation they are requesting is not reasonable. And in that case, the court agreed with the housing authority based on prior, as I recall, extensive attempts by the housing authority to intervene, to help with the language difficulties, to, to deal with the, the that the quote accommodation of staying was in fact unreasonable, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. 
What would be the reasonable accommodation here? If he stays on his medications, I understand he's fine, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. But if he doesn't, then the risk of this thing happening may, re may, may reoccur, right? That's so correct. So how does the housing authority make sure he stays on his medications? There are many possible ways that that could be accomplished. Um, one way would be to have it be, um, as the single justice in the appeals court did here essentially, is to have um, his tenancy be conditioned have it be a probational tenancy, essentially, that was conditioned oh, sure, on but, but how, how practically do you enforce that? This, this kind of thing actually takes place all the time in the housing court, as some of the cases in the um, amicus brief set forth. But one possible way is that um, the tenant reports regular, regularly to the housing court, or his um, health care providers re report regularly to the housing court, or report regularly to the, the housing authority. How, do, All how, of do, how does anybody know whether he's taking his medication? That, that is, um, his, his, if, if, if need be, his, um, his uh, health care providers could report. I mean, there's many. But they know. Suppose he says, I mean, if, if he says, I'm taking see, it. They, they see him and they can assess. They see him, but I mean, in some, I mean, this hasn't been proposed here, but in, in some cases, they, they're, situations where where people are not taking medications and there's a history of that which is not the case here but um, where they're actually their health care provider watches or, or some worker watches the tenant the, the individual take their medication on a regular basis every day and if necessary I mean that that could be a possible accommodation I, I don't think it's necessary in this case because there's no suggestion from anyone that um, the tenant has not been taking he was it wasn't that he stopped his doctor had suspended his medications due to side effects and he and and he and right after the incident he consulted the doctor got back on his medications um, all indications have been that he's continuing to take them but if that were hypothetically a, a concern it's certainly something that could be addressed in a, in a way that um, that you know to, to whatever extent necessary and, and it does happen in other cases is that what you're saying um, yes. it did, I've never heard of a case where someone was actually observed, but I've certainly No, no, heard, no, but yeah. I mean the, the, this idea of, of Yes, with probational, yes, absolutely. And, and some of the cases in the um, amicus brief submitted on behalf of um, the Mass Coalition for the Housing set, set forth examples, such as that. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Joshua. Mr. Coppola, yes. good morning. Good morning. Um, first, if I may, getting to a question that was raised. Appendix uh, Volume 1, page 13, contains the notes of the private conference. And quoting from that, residents' comments during conference, Mr. Bridgewater's attorney could not attend the meeting due to a prior commitment. Mr. Bridgewater's chose not to say anything without his legal representation. So right. you can find the answer there. But that, I think that's consistent with what Ms. Judge mm -hmm. had said. Yes, was it whether the social, what the social worker said was the question. I think. Well, I think, I think what she said is that the social workers directed Mr. Bridgewater's not to say anything. It was Mr. Bridgewater's choice. I don't find a nexus in this case between bipolarism and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, assault and battery with a dangerous person, and simple assault and battery, for which he received as a sentence of incarceration that was suspended for two years. Well, I don't know you what. don't, are you a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor, but I'm looking at the testimony, and at no point during the trial did Mr. Bridgewater say, I beat up my brother because I have bipolarism. Mm -hmm. He said, my brother broke my computer four days before because he was downloading male pornography, and he tried to bite me and give me AIDS. And then he went downstairs and he saw the police and he said, don't go talk to my brother because he's going to tell you lies. Meanwhile, his brother's lying upstairs. He was paralyzed since he was the age we, of We've one. read the facts. Okay. His comments during trial are incredible. On the one hand, he's saying he was acting in self-defense. On the other hand, he's saying that any injuries that were sustained were self-inflicted. At trial, he said, I accept to a certain degree my responsibility. But he's telling the court two different things. The court but that's not unusual. I mean, you may think it's incredible, but it's not unusual for people to argue in the alternative. There's no question that he said more than once, as my defense, my mental illness in words and substance. I don't believe he said it was my mental illness. He made references to being off medication. I thought that's what the Isn't that 
No, because I think to say that would be to say that people with bipolarism are prone to violent outbursts. And I they think can be. They can be and they cannot be. Many are productive members of society. And for us to allow that sort of stereotypical treatment of a disease is the very reason that the ADA and the Rehab Act and all these other things say no, simply because a person says, I have but, a... But you've got to look at the issue, Mr. Koppoff. We're not trying to tell you what the answer is. I think the question is, you've got to look at the issue. The issue in this case is that a person proved himself to be not a qualified person with a disability who, with or without reasonable accommodation, could perform the functions of his lease, just like in Mamoni. Mamoni is an employment case, Mr. Koppoff. But as this court said in Mamoni and in Skolnick, the same treatment... It, there's no difference, and I think to treat employee cases different from housing cases is dangerous. It's not and dangerous. It may be required by the words of the statute. No, I think it's dangerous because in a housing development where we have our most vulnerable tenants. I understand that. They Can have to live. you agree with me that the words of the statutes differ? But this court said. I, do, do, do you agree with me that the two, there are two different statutory schemes? Well, there's several different statutes. There's uh, section five. Do you agree with me that there are different statutory schemes? Mm -hmm. But I thought this court's holding in Mamoni and Skolnick made it clear that following Arlene, following Southeastern Community College versus Davis. The purpose of the laws was to put everyone So up. are you saying, going back to the trial, <clears throat> we already told us about the pre-trial. He didn't say anything about what we're arguing about today. The trial, he said, I want to stay, in so many words, because I didn't do it. He did it to himself. Um, or I was acting in self-defense. Not Or I, I was acting it. in self-defense. No, he, he said, I was acting in self-defense. No, he also said the wounds were self-inflicted. But that's at the criminal trial, right? No. 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 He pled guilty. Yeah. Well, well, what I'm it. saying to you is if he said those two things in substance, I didn't do it, self-inflicted, or he attacked me and I defended myself, there's nothing in there that would raise reasonable accommodation. I agree. Yeah. I but he said I have a disability. That I'm off my defenses. I was... <clears throat> off my medication. Mm -hmm. With his doctor's permission. Whether that... I, I understand, but, the court. but I mean, he said, in my defense, I was off my medication. I'm now back on my medication. But the court rejected that in Peabody versus Sherman. But that was some... That, that was the drug case, correct? Yes, it was. A, a voluntary taker of illicit drugs, correct? Yes, but he claimed at the time that the case came to trial, which was much later than this case came to trial, I'm clean, I'm in a program, I'm yeah, working. but that's not, I mean, Mental there distance. is a big dis difference between having a bipolar condition and being on medication for that and taking drugs and saying I'm clean. And there's a big difference between taking drugs and committing a heinous, violent act on another BHA tenant. That is quantitatively different. We're not talking about a direct risk, a direct threat case like the, uh, the Fair Housing Act talks about. We're talking about a case where a heinous, terrible thing has occurred. Um, we, but isn't the fact uh, here that the defendant's conduct was isolated and in most of the cases um, the conduct of the employee or the tenant is repeated? No, I don't think that's the, the standard at all. Uh, in Mamoni, there was a period of mania where he... Um, acted out, he's made various anti-employer comments, he came to work dressed in traditional West Indian garb, and that was considered insufficient for him to be an assistant curator, I think, at Harvard. In this case, a man I submit nearly killed another man, but the argument is he should be allowed to stay there. I don't see the difference. I really don't. When you're a tenant in public housing, you live there 24 hours, 7 days a week. When you're an employment case, you come and you leave. But to live with someone who has already proven, who's pled out, pled out to two... But, but Mr. Coppola, yeah. I mean, isn't the question not what the bottom line should be, but whether you should have considered it? No. I think the case law is clear from this court, as well as others, that the initial, the initial determination is a legal one, and the courts have agreed. 
It is whether or not a person can follow the basic dictates of the lease in federal law. Are you familiar law. with the Eighth Circuit's decision in um, Ludecky against Shula? I'm sorry. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. So this is not a test, but I'm just quoting from that. To determine whether FHA requires accommodations, although tenancy may be denied, if the individual poses a direct and significant risk of harm to health and safety of others, if a reasonable accommodation could eliminate the risk, entities covered under, under the FHA, which BHA is, are required to engage in such accommodation. Doesn't that mean that at very minimum, you can't just look at, the, at, the, at what happened, but you have to look to see, at least under federal law, if he had killed the victim, would we be here today? That's the question. Does it come down to how serious the harm is? That was the Penfield case. No, the case. question is, do you have an obligation to see whether or not there can be a reasonable accommodation? It's possible. It is possible that there cannot be, as in Skolnik. But isn't that implicit in what you're saying is, there was no accommodation that could exactly. be made when someone commits such a serious violent exactly. offense. That's exactly. your position? He removed, yes, sir. He removed himself from the... Isn't that contrary to what, how the federal courts, circuit decisions of the federal courts, have interpreted it? In other words, you have to look to see on an individual basis whether or not there can be a reasonable accommodation. That was done in this case. Where? It was in, in determining, in looking at the files, and looking at the medical records, and looking at the plea, all of those factors were considered with by regard whom? by the BHA. The medical records and the plea? And what, where, is yes. that in the record? No, I don't believe that's in the record. It's not in the record? What, the consideration before trial? No, those are all pretrial considerations that any landlord takes into effect before no, beginning a suit. You, you can't rely on that. Well, Your Honor. The specifics of the case show that this man pled out to a crime. When somebody is under an obligation to consider reasonable accommodation, I, when somebody is under an obligation to consider reasonable accommodation, I don't think it's an adequate proffer to say it's not in the record but we did. Whether it's an employer or a landlord or anybody else, we ask them to tell us what the consideration was. The answer to your question, then, I can't give because it's not in the record. But, isn't, but the burden, you agree with me, the burden shifts to the landlord or to the employer to demonstrate that a reasonable accommodation was not possible. There was no reasonable, I submit, there was no reasonable accommodation no, no, request agree? made in this case. Then it would shift to the landlord. Once a reasonable, a valid reasonable accommodation request, as this Court has said, mere forbearance, except in a case like Whittier where, where we're dealing with a cat. You can't have it both ways, Mr. Coppola. You can't say we did consider reasonable accommodation. We didn't. You did not. No. He removed himself, we believe, from the ambit of any fair reading of the discrimination laws. The point was to level the playing field. What was it that he did that removed him from consideration? Beating up a co-tenant, violating his lease, and pleading out to it in criminal court. Is it because of the nature of the offense that he pled out to? Or what if it had been not assault and battery uh, with a dangerous weapon and any other charges, but a, a different, I, I don't know. Uh, malicious destruction. Yeah, property. malicious destruction. That would be an entirely different situation. But we entirely. don't know that. You're, you're saying, if I understand well, correctly. I the question is asked, but that would be the response. This was in the nature of a Chapter 139 proceeding, a statutory nuisance, which has specific meaning in housing cases. It's, I'm sorry. Man. If he had made a specific request for an accommodation, how and when would it have been handled by the housing authority? The policy is, is that if a person makes a request for a reasonable accommodation at any time before trial, that is handled at the BHA in a conversation, a dialogue between the person and the BHA. And is a record kept of that dialogue? 
Yes, if one exists. Isn't his request here to remain a tenant a request for reasonable accommodation? Because nobody's denying that he violated the lease. I'm, I'm sorry. There's no claim that he did not violate the lease. And so, right. as Justice Cordy said, his request to remain as a tenant is a request for reasonable accommodation. But as this Court said in Peabody v. Sherman, requests for forbearance except where the damage is very, very small, as in Penfield or as in Whittier Terrace, that is not a legitimate request. Once the act is done, that person is no longer a qualified individual with a handicap. So what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is that if in this kind of act you cannot request accommodation, that's impossible because of the nature of the act. Is that right? You can request it, but there is no reasonable accommodation that this Court or any of the other courts, including Arlene, including Davis. But the BHA doesn't even need to think about it. No, because the defendant is free to bring that up at trial. And if this Court finds that he made a request for reasonable accommodation while at the same time denying responsibility, the Court could have ordered the BHA. But I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. I thought what you were just saying in response to the Chief Justice was because this isn't malicious destruction of property, it's a heinous, to use your word, act or series of acts. And because that is so, by definition, as a matter of law, there is no accommodation that could happen, and therefore we don't have to even get to the issue. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And the reason why is that was this Court's holding in Garrity. That was this Court's holding in Peabody v. Sherman. That was this Court's holding in Mamoni. That was this Court's holding in Skolnik. That was the Court's holding in, not in Arlene, but in Davis. Yes, there are certain things that people do that remove them from the ambit of the protection. Mr. Bridgewaters thus far has been treated differently than a non-handicapped person would. I don't think there's any doubt that he would have been evicted a long time ago and probably be reapplied. In this case, he's hiding behind it, using it as a shelter. That is not, I believe, what the Congress or the general court meant when they enacted the various anti-discrimination laws. That's generally true of reasonable accommodation, that somebody who's not disabled is going to be treated differently. Isn't that so? Not, no. The idea is to treat them with a reasonable accommodation. Regarding housing matters, this Court said in Peabody, we are not going to accept monitoring his drug treatment because that pertains to non-housing matters, and we're not going to impose that on a housing authority, which is not really a social service agency. First and foremost, it's a landlord. It's a landlord. And that was the decision in 1993. And I see nothing in Garrity or Mamoni or Skolnik that changes any of that. And I hope you find the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Kolbenkamp. Thank you. Mr. Kolbenkamp, Mr. Kolbenkamp, thank you. The case just argued is submitted.